So today is a very special episode and today we're going to talk about the periodic table. Now this one you may uh, recognize from the f very first episode that I made about nine months ago. This was a periodic table that was sent to me by my father-in-law uh, thinking that he actually ordered the, the periodic table. He, we, he received this and, and gave it to me and it was basically the start of, of this channel because after this I started searching for a supplier of uh, maybe something that could provide this for real. And in my search I found Engineered Labs where I'm now doing the, where I'm now ordering cubes and these cubes contain the elements of the periodic table. So basically I've been talking about these elements and about chemistry for nine months now and about two months ago I received a message from Engineered Lab stating that they wanted to collaborate more with me. And what they did then really surprised me and I'm really happy to show you this because it was really beautiful. They actually sent me a table, a periodic table, with the actual elements in here as you can see. Now this is a, 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 one of the tables that basically has a, has a little bit of a mistake in there, but I love it nonetheless. It's, it's, a, it's a great, great periodic table. I love it. And this set me thinking um, for two reasons. First of all, this is, I think, one of the best things that you can buy from Engineered Labs because, yeah, it is expensive, but then you have an actual periodic table at your house with all the elements in there. Now, uh, I know they recently built quite a few of them, so if you want one, click on the link in the description. Uh, you can get 10% off and you will be also helping this channel. Um, but yeah, I think this is one of the best products that they're, uh, that they're selling. I will, at the end of the video, also show some of the other products that they're selling, which do not have to do anything uh, with, uh, with chemistry, but eh, maybe you like them nonetheless. So now the second reason why I'm doing this specific video is not only because I get now have this beautiful periodic table with all the elements, but also because, well, I'm talking a lot about the elements and all the specific properties that they have and, and their history, but I don't tend to talk a lot about the periodic table itself. And I searched a little bit online and, uh, and I didn't find a lot of videos where they basically just go through like 20 most asked questions about the periodic table. So it seemed a fun thing to do, to basically go through 20 normal questions that somebody could have when they are looking at the periodic table. So here we go again. Welcome to Cube Chemistry, where we will discuss all the elements of the periodic table and also do experiments. And if you like this video and want to see more, make sure to subscribe. Also, make sure to fill in the poll so you can influence the element that we will discuss next week. So without further ado, these are 20 very frequently asked questions about the periodic table and they're in a completely arbitrary order. So let's immediately dive into the first question. And the first question is who created the periodic table? Was it actually created by one man? Well, it actually was. It was created by a man named Dmitry Mendeleev, a Russian chemist. And he developed the first modern periodic table in 1869. He arranged the elements by increasing atomic mass and left gaps for undiscovered elements, predicting their properties. Question number two. Why is it actually called the periodic table? Well, it's called periodic because elements are arranged in repeating patterns, periods, based on their properties and their atomic structure. Now another question that you may have is how is the periodic table organized? Well, elements are arranged by increasing atomic number, the number of protons. Rows are called periods and columns are called groups or families, as you can see here. So when you look at this periodic table, specifically the one that I'm, uh, that I'm showing here, you can see a lot of numbers. Now what do these numbers mean? Well, first of all, at the top left in these little boxes, you can see the atomic number. And this is basically the number of protons that an element has. So in this case, we see helium here on the top right. And you can see here that it has number two, which means that it has two protons. Now, you also can see uh, another number at the bottom. Well, this is the atomic mass. It is usually shown uh, in, in this position. And... It is the weighted average mass of an atom's isotope. So, in the case of helium, that would be 
So earlier we talked a little bit about how the periodic table is organized. And we talked about um, uh, basically periods and we talked about groups. Now, um, why are elements actually placed in groups? Well, we can, we can basically talk a little bit more about that by, by showing this group, for instance, which is the hydrogen group. And below in that hydrogen group, you have group, you have uh, lithium, sodium, potassium, and so on and so forth. Now, all these elements have similar characteristics when it comes down uh, to, to chemicals. And why is that? Well, actually, it turns out that they all have in common that they have a valence electron. In fact, every group that you can see here has the same amount of valence electrons, so let's say extra electrons, in their outer shelf. And that is basically the same for every group. Now, if you take the first group, which is basically the hydrogen group, you can see that they are in the first group. And that means that they all start with one electron being valence in their, in their outer shell. And this is also why they react so strongly with a lot of other elements, because they want to get rid of that electron. Right? They're, they're really happy to give it away, because then they will get to the noble gas configuration, which we will talk about later. Because if they give one electron away, um, for in the case of lithium, for instance, it will have two electrons, and then it will be the same as helium, and it will be content about that. So this is a little bit about why we, we put things in groups. Now we have, for instance, uh, uh, francium, which is a very uh, quite a rare element, and the, the 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 thing is that we know a little bit about its properties, even though before we discovered it, because this is basically um, yeah you 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 can you can see it in the same group, so you know it will have one valence electron and therefore will be very reactive. Now then, immediately the next question becomes: What are the periods in the periodic table? Well, periods are the rows on the table, and each period represents elements with the same number of electron shells. So, what does that mean? Well, in this case, that means that helium and hydrogen, th those are basically the first one in the, in, the, in the first period, so to speak. You can see that in that first electron shell, there is only place for two electrons. Now, you can see that in the second period, so basically lithium till neon, you will have um, eight electrons. And the same goes for um, uh, sodium till argon. So that's, that's basically how you can see it. So basically the, the period tells you the electron sh shell that is currently being filled. So immediately that brings up the next question. What are these two strange rows at the bottom? Because they seem to be some kind of disconnected from the rest of the periodic table. Well, these rows are the lanthanides and the actinides. And um, they are part of the inner transition metals. And they're placed below to keep the co table compact. Well, I can imagine that that doesn't make a lot of sense. So let's let's dig into what these what these are. Well, you can see here that they're basically this, these are basically elements 57 to 71, and here you can see that there's a little box which basically says this is 15 to 70, 57 to 71, right? Well, actually, these two rows belong there. Now, that actually means that they're currently, if you look at all those shells, you can see that there is, um, there is only seven shells that we currently have, um, that we currently put electrons in. Now the problem, if you would put them there, um, you would need an acrylic box basically being twice the size that you have right now. And this is why they decided to put it under there. Um, so hope that makes sense. The next question about the periodic table is, what is the most abundant element in the universe? Well, hydrogen, which makes up about 75% uh, of the universe's mass. Uh, it's the simplest and lightest element as well. And if you want to see an episode about it, make sure to watch this one. So then immediately the next question could be, what is the heaviest element of the, uh, of the periodic table? Well, that is organesson. It has atomic number 118 and it sits here at the bottom. It is the heaviest element uh, that we discovered so far, and it's a synthetic and highly unstable element. Um, now, you can see it here, and it, is, it has at least 118 protons, and you can see that its atomic mass is 294, which is actually quite similar, by the way, to tennessine, but, uh, but it's still heavier. 
Now, immediately, then we get the next question. What is the smallest element? Well, like just discussed, hydrogen is the most simplest element, but it's also the most small element. Hydrogen is the smallest element with just one proton and one electron. So I just explained that organesson is a synthetic element, which means that apparently there are synthetic elements that are created by men, and there are, of course, elements that occur in nature. Now, immediately that raises the questions, what is the rarest natural occurring element? Well, that would be element number 85, AT, which stands for astatine. And it's the rarest, with less than one gram estimated to exist in Earth's crust at any given time. Now, another question could be, why do some symbols do not match their names? Now, let's look at some of these symbols. We can see here helium, H-E. So that makes sense. We have hydrogen, which makes sense, H. But now here we got gold, um, that is basically A-U. Now, many of the symbols come from Latin or Greek names, like gold. Uh, and, and, and gold, basically, uh, in, in Latin, uh, was aurum. Um, so this is why they use the letters a U and iron um, used to be in in ancient Rome or in Latin ferum and that's why we use the letters F E so this is the reason why sometimes these letters do not match with the symbols next question is how many elements are there in the periodic system well as of now there are 118 confirmed elements and well let's hope that at some point it will be 119 it will be very interesting Currently, there is uh, 94 natural occurring, and the rest is basically all synthetic, created by men. So let's get back to noble gases. What are noble gases? Well, here you have group 18, and those are the noble gases. So basically, the, the ones under helium. And other examples are neon, argon, krypton. Why are they called noble gases? Well, um, they're called noble gases because they don't react easily because they have a full outer electron shell. And this is what I meant. They have their electron shell full and therefore they don't react with anything. They don't want to give up electrons. They don't want to take electrons. They're satisfied exactly where they are. And this is the difference between the group before that with the, with the fluorines and the one with the hydrogen that have an extra valence electron, you have fluorine, which basically lack that one electron and really want to get that one extra electron in. Um, noble gases don't have that problem. And this is uh, why they are what they are, inert. So in a lot of videos, I'm talking about transition metals. Now, what are transition metals? Basically, we talk about transition metals if we talk about group three till group 12 of the elements. There are elements like iron, copper, gold, and they are good conductors of electricity and often form colorful compounds, such as, well, like you can see here, 29, copper, uh, number 79 being, uh, being gold. Uh, here you can see vanadium, which has quite a, quite a beautiful appearance as well. So these are basically the transition metals. Now, we just talked about valence electrons and that it makes uh, elements reactive if they are really close to that, uh, that noble gas configuration. But what would be the most reactive element? Well, fluorine is, one of, is the most reactive non-metal and francium is the most reactive metal. Fluorine aggressively reacts with almost everything. Now, we sometimes talk about radioactivity. But why are some of the elements radioactive? Well, elements are radioactive when their nuclei are unstable and break apart, releasing energy. Uranium and plutonium are well-known examples. So atoms have all a specific size. And what would be a periodic trend for atomic size? Well, atomic sizes decreases across a period from left to right because of the increasing nuclear charge and it increases down a group as more electrical shells or electron shells are added. Now, again, what does this mean? Well, it means the following. It basically means that as soon as you start to put on, as an atom starts to put on an electron, it reduces in size. So it gets like a little bit more dense if you, if, you, if you want. And this is basically what you see. So you will see that krypton is basically has a certain size, but as soon as you go down uh, from, from uh, to element 20, for instance, to, to calcium, it will decrease in size, which is pretty counterintuitive if you think about it. 
Now we also talked about um, synthetic elements and natural elements, but how are synthetic elements made? Well, synthetic elements are created in laboratories using particle accelerators or nuclear reactors, where some atoms are smashed together under extreme conditions. So then let's get to the overarching question, which is why is the periodic table important? Well, it's the ultimate cheat sheet for chemistry. It helps scientists predict element properties, reactions and behavior, making it fundamental to understanding matter. Now before we conclude this episode, I also want to point out that Engineered Labs makes other things as well than just stuff uh, about chemistry and elements. So for instance, one of the things that they do is they put in acrylic cubes or they make these little memorabilia and museums around uh, artifacts. And one of them is, for instance, this. This is a piece of barbed wire from Omaha Beach, uh, which is dated uh, well, around 1944. Um, it's, I'm actually going to use this specific part for my episode about iron, because you can see how beautiful it oxidates, and uh, that needs a little bit of um, explanation, I guess. But they also have these little museas, which contain a lot of memorabilia and, and just fun stuff. A woolly mammoth tusk, or uh, for instance here, a Viking axe head, or a piece of a Lockheed U-2 spy plane. I am at no point thinking about making episode about all these things, uh, but you can buy these. And I think they go uh, great for gifts for people that do not necessarily want to have their own periodic table. But maybe want to have something different or have a, have a really affinity for, uh, for history. I will put the links down in the description so you can buy them also with a 10% discount and help out this channel. So that concludes the episode for today. If you like this video and want to see more, make sure to subscribe. And if you um, want to leave anything in the comments because I've missed something, also put it there. Also make sure to fill in the poll for next week so you can influence that element that we will be discussing then.